Let's learn a little bit about Parshas Yisra now. Uh, tonight's uh, Tuvi Shvat, so make sure you have uh, your fruits for tonight. Sorry we didn't uh, uh, we didn't uh, serve any uh, fruits uh, today, but uh, we had a beautiful, beautiful uh, Tuvi Shvat Seder Moksei Shabbat from the Shluchim, and it's now actually up on YouTube. We'll post the link to it in the, the uh, our, our email before Shabbos. But today we'll talk about Parshas Yisro, and uh, the pasuk that I'd like to focus on is one of the uh, prefatory. Uh, sentences that Moshe used when he was introducing the Jewish people to Matan Torah, to the giving of the Torah. And he wanted to prepare them and make sure that they would accept the Torah and appreciate the tremendous gift it was. And so Hashem tells him uh, in Perak Yotes, he says, Kos Yaakov, This is what you should tell to the house of Jacob, which Rashi says refers to the women. Israel and inform the Bnei Israel, which refers to the men. We know here that uh, the women were presented with the Torah before the men were. That'll be another share for another time. Um, but the pasuk that we're going to focus on today is Atem Reisem Asher Asisla You, the Jewish people, have seen that which I have done to Egypt. I have borne you on the wings of eagles. Actually, the word nisharim, because some people translate as vultures, because a nesher is really uh, the eagle and the vulture are part of the same family. But it sort of sounds a little yucky to say that God bore us on vultures' wings. So we generally translate it as eagle's wings. Right? The eagle is a much more majestic, uh, important kind of bird. And I brought you unto me. And therefore, ve'ata, and now, if you listen to my voice, and you observe my covenant, you'll be to me a treasure among all the nations, because the entire world is mine. And therefore, I'll make sure that you get elevated, an elevated status among the other nations of the world. We know that there's a famous uh, Rashi over here that explains what the term al kanfe nisharim means, on the wings of eagles. And Rashi says, Kenesher Hanasei goes alav al kenafav that I bore you just like an eagle who carries its chicks on its wings. And Rashi goes to, goes to the explanation that, you know, uh, the, the eagle is the most protective parent of its chicks because it's the high, it flies to the highest altitudes so that no other birds can swoop down and attack its young. And uh, it protects, the only thing that it has to protect its chicks from are the arrows that come from below, and it's prepared to take the the the, the uh, arrow in order to protect its own um, its own uh, its own offspring, and that's what Hakadosh Baruch Hu basically says. He says, "I have therefore placed myself in in the crosshairs for you, the Jewish people. I've lowered myself. I've allowed myself to be defiled in this uh, world of Egypt." but in order to take you out and to carry you and to uh, hold you aloft above the rest of the world. Um, the, only, the only difficulty that I have is that normally when the Torah wants to, com to, sh to talk about how God has taken us out of Egypt, um, uh, you know, when, when normally the Torah speaks in simile more than it speaks in metaphor. It really goes back to what we talked about, you know, God taking us out, biyad chazaka, with Israel and it's one of the few times when the Torah speaks in pure metaphor, but when it comes to the, the way that God 
bears the Jewish people. You know, we find Moshe Rabbeinu when he talks about how he's had to bear the Jewish people. It's with the letter Chaf, Ka'asher Yisaho Menas Hayonek. Like I, um, I have cared for the Jewish people just like a wet nurse serves her serves her little infant, or like um, like Moshe Rabbeinu sings in Parshas Ha'azinu. He says, Kinesher Yer Kino, that just like an eagle watches over its nest, Al goes, I love your Achev, it hovers over its chicks. And, you know, it's interesting that over here it doesn't say, Vo Esso Eschem Ke Al Kan Fenishem, like, I, like I, I, it's not that God says, I bore you as if you were on wings of eagles. It's literally, I bore you on wings of eagles. And so, in order to, when the Torah uses a metaphor, there's got to be something much more literal that we're supposed to be able to draw out of this imagery that the Torah is portraying for us and that's really what I wanted to um, to try and discuss today. If you look at, uh, there's a Pasuk in the Torah that talks about the mitzvah of tzitzit, the mitzvah of men wearing tzitzis and it's in Parshas Bamidbar Perak Tesvav and the way that the Torah describes the tzitzis is it says, V'asu lahem tzitzis al kanfei vigdehem lidorosam they shall place or make for themselves sitzes upon the corners of their garments for all generations. Now the word kanfe is something that Rashi picks up on. And if you take a look at Rashi over there, al kanfe vigdehem, this is Rashi in Parshas, uh, Parshas Shlach, it says, keneged vo esa eschem al kanfe nisharim, that as, uh, this corresponds to having borne you on wings of eagles. <coughs> so the question of course is, you know, what's the connection? That God bore us on wings of eagles, and how do you say a wing? Kenafayim. Kenafayim kanfe, your wings. And a kanaf is also a corner. So it's the same word. So therefore, when a person puts on sitsis, they immediately remind themselves that God bore us on wings of eagles. It seems like a very loose connection. The fact that the corner of a garment has sitsis on it, and you're supposed to remind yourself of the wings of eagles. So what's, what's really the connection? And of course, one of the most important questions that we have to ask is, why is this Pusik used sort of as the sales pitch for, for the Torah? Okay, God, it's great that you bore us on wings of eagles. And it's a beautiful imagery. It's almost like, you know, that would be the opening of the movie for the Exodus, right? Wings of eagles and uh, the great image of uh, God taking the Jews out of Egypt. But why is that metaphor sort of the introductory metaphor to describe now why the Jewish people should receive the Torah and commit themselves to become Hashem's people? What is it about that metaphor that makes this, this compelling argument that we should commit ourselves to Hashem. If Hashem had not borne us on wings of eagles, but had taken us through some other vehicle, uh, but uh, and uh, God would have instead said, I took you out with a Yad Chazaka and a Zero and a Tuya, would there be any less of a reason for us to accept the Torah? So that's really also what's something that we should really uh, try to consider. There's a Pasuk in Micha, in the book of Micha, that reads as follows. Korchi vagozi al b'nei ta'anugayich. That's a, it's a totally unrelated pasuk. It's a pasuk in Micha that talks about how the Jewish people should go into mourning because of the Jews who are going into the diaspora, into the exile. And it says korchi. What does the word korchi mean? Make a bald spot for yourself, which is the, the, the method of mourning is that people used to pull their hair out. They literally pull their hair out to express their great distress. Vagozi, to create a place of shearing. Albinei ta'anugayach, over their children who gave you so much pleasure in the past. Harchivi korchoseich keneshem. That expand your bald area like the eagle. And so what does that pasuk mean? <coughs> Make yourself bald like an eagle. So, of course, this is the source for the great icon of the United States of America. Make yourself bald like an eagle. Um, but what's, what's the import of make yourselves bald like an eagle? 
If you take a look at, at Rashi over there, Rashi in that Pasuk on Micha is this Kitargumo, like the, like the Targum, Kinishra Dinatru Gadfohi, that it's like an eagle who molts, that's the right word, yes, you use that word, molts, it molts its feathers, its feathers fall off, an eagle's feathers fall off, Derech Hanesha Limareit Rov Kinafav. It is the way of the eagle to molt the majority of its feathers, and that's the way an eagle sort of regains or rejuvenates itself, is that it jettisons its feathers, um, and they sort of shed, and then it regrows the feathers and when it's ready for the new season, or I don't know exactly the patterns of molting, I haven't studied ornithology, but, uh, but, <coughs> but that's the way the, the eagle gets stronger, it rejuvenates itself. And we have the same principle in a Pasuk in Yeshaya. It says, Bekove Hashem Yachalifu Choach, that those who place their hopes in God, Yachalifu Choach, they renew their, their vigor, they renew their strength. Ya'alu Ever Kinesharim, they'll renew their limbs or they'll renew their wings like eagles. Yarutsu Velo Yiga'u, Yelchu Velo Yi'afu, they run without getting tired, they go without being worn out. So, um, so the Radak over there even says, he quotes Rav Re- Sadjago. He says, shanim ma'od al that there's this legend that was uh, around in the times of Rav Sadjago that an, an eagle, every ten years, flies so high that it goes up very, very close to the sun. It gets up high to the to the heat of the sun or the fire, this ethereal fire that exists in the high atmosphere. The apilat smoliyam mirov chomo, and because it gets so hot or heated from the fire, it throws itself into the ocean to cool off. The imaret, and then it's, as a result, all of its feathers fall off. The ischadei shachar kain, and then it rejuvenates itself afterwards. The yale aver, and it grows sort of like new wings or new feathers. The yashuv liyamei alumav, and it returns to its to its days of youth, um, and so that's uh, that's the legend of what happens to an eagle and how it molts its feathers. But I think that um, I think the idea of what the Torah is trying to tell us is that when I took you out of Egypt, I took you on wings of eagles. Now, what is an eagle's wings supposed to now represent? If we now understand that the whole idea of nesher comes from the word no share, it's no coincidence, isn't it? Is it? The word no share means what? to shed or to fall off. The reason why a nesher is called a nesher is because it sheds its old identity. It sheds its old, its old feathers. And when HaKadosh Baruch Hu was telling us that I bore you on kanfei nesharim, on the wings of eagles, it is really Hashem telling us that leaving Egypt was a one-way ticket. There is no way to get back the same way you got out. Because that vehicle, the way that I took you out was on, the, the metaphor being, was on a vehicle that deteriorates and cannot bring you back to where you came in. That's why I think the Torah is using this very, very stark metaphor, is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was essentially presenting to the Jewish people, you know too much, because you've already seen too much. You could never possibly return back to a life of normalcy. You could never return back to the life of being a slave in Egypt because you've been so elevated at this point. You can't go back. It's like Plato has this famous metaphor of the cave where he talks about how someone, the world, he says, is like a bunch of people who are chained. <coughs> this is in Plato's Republic. He talks about uh, how everyone in the world is blind, and really there's a whole reality out there that uh, that people are oblivious to. We're like people who are, and he gives this amazing, very famous metaphor about people who have been chained their entire lives in a cave, and the position of the chains are such that we can't move to turn around to look at the mouth of the entrance of the cave. All we can see is the back wall of the cave, and the light that is coming in from the mouth of the cave projects shadows on the wall of reality. So all we can see are the shadows. 
And then Plato discusses how one day, one of the prisoners who's chained in the cave is freed from his chains. He's able to turn around and he sees reality. And so the idea there is, is that once you've seen the reality of what God's world is about and who Hashem is, and you go and see there's a whole world out there that's much beyond the shadows. The shadows is just, just this pale representation. You can't go back. Why would anyone want to go back to be rechained and go back to the cave and just look at shadows for the rest of their lives? Hashem says, I've liberated you, not, in, not only in the physical sense, but I've removed those shackles so that you've been able to turn around and remove the veil and see the world for what it is. It's this miraculous place where God is supervising everything that's going on. How could you possibly ever go back? That's the kanfei nisharim that the Torah is talking about. And it's because of that that I believe that that's the reason why they're related to the tzitzit, that's related to tzitzis. Because the whole function of tzitzis is to try and remind the individual that we are an elevated people, that it could ne we could never go back to a life of mundaneness, to try and pull ourselves and reincorporate ourselves to the shadowy vision of the rest of the world. That's what the whole purpose of Tzitzis is. And that's why Rashi says there's a correlation to Kanfei Nisharim and the Kanaf of the Petil Techelet, of that blue thread that reminds you of that divine reality that the rest of the world cannot see. And with that, we may be able to understand the very interesting story in the Gemara, <coughs> and that this will conclude. Take a look at the bottom of your sheet. Great story. Great story. Tanya, Amar Rabbi Natan, Rabbi Natan once taught, "Ein lachal kol mitzvah kala shekesuva b'Torah, she'ein matan sechara ba'olam hazeh." Every mitzvah, even the lightest of mitzvahs, will provide you reward in this world. Ula olam haba, eni yodei akama, but in the world to come, the reward is infinite and there's no way to even measure it. And how can you learn this? Say ulamad mi mitzvah tzitzis. You can learn this from the, the mitzvah of tzitzis itself, which is supposed to be the exemplar for all of the other mitzvah. But here's the story that I wanted to get to. Maasei ba'adam echad shahaya zahir mi mitzvah tzitzis. There was once a man, he was very careful in the mitzvah of tzitzis. And as we'll see, he wasn't so careful in other stuff. <laughs> He heard that there was this amazing prostitute somewhere really, really far away. And he heard that uh, she was very expensive. She, it cost you 400 gold pieces to spend an evening with her. And so apparently there was something very, very spectacular about her. So he sent ahead the 400 gold pieces and he made an appointment. The time arrived and he came to this woman and he went and sat at the doorway. So he sits there at the doorway. This woman's uh, uh, the butler or, or, or maid opens the door and, she, and he tells her matron that the guy that sent you the 400 gold pieces is waiting at the door. So she said, okay, let him tell him to come in. Nichnas, he comes in. Heitzielo zayin mitot. She sets off this beautiful, elaborate mattress of seven layers of mattresses. Sheish shel kesef echa shel zahav. Six mattresses that with a, a, a silver frame and one gold frame. Uben kolechas veecha sulam shel kesef elyona shel zahav. And between each bed frame there was a ladder made out of silver, and the highest ladder was made out of gold. He basically wants to build up the excitement, right? You, uh, we're going to have to climb to, uh, to be able to get to our, to our final destination. Also, the Yashval Gabi El Yona, Keshihi Aruma. So she goes up to the top layer and of the bed, and uh, she's unclothed. Ve'afu Allah le'shev Arum Kinegda. And he's getting very excited, so he's about to remove all of his clothes. He starts to get undressed. And his four tzitzis, as he's taking them off, his, the tzitzis themselves slap him in the face. 
In other words, he's getting so excited, he's pulling off his scissors, and then they slap him in the face. So this sort of jars him back to reality, and nishmat the yashavlo agabe karka. So he goes and he sits down on the floor, sort of in a state of confusion and mourning. The afi nishmata the yashavlo agabe karka. So she's sitting up there, she's probably saying, where is this guy, right? And finally she realizes, hey, he's sitting on the floor, so she goes and puts her robe on and she goes sits on the floor. So umrelo, and she says, I swear by the God of Rome, I'm not going to let you leave until you tell me what you saw that, like, what's wrong with me? Why don't you want to be with me? So Amar He says, I swear that I've never seen a woman as beautiful as you. But God gave us one mitzvah. It's the mitzvah of tzitzis. And it says, I'm the Lord your God, twice in that mitzvah. I am the God who will has the ability to exact punishment. But I'm also the God who can also give you tremendous reward for your obedience. So, so therefore, it's almost like these two times when it says, Ani Hashem Elokeichem, they're like four witnesses, two witnesses for punishment and two witnesses for reward. So, Amr lo, eni mani checha, chetomar li ma shemecha, u ma shem ircha. So she said, I'm not going to let you leave until you tell me your name and where you come from, u ma shem rabcha, who your teacher is, u ma shem midrashcha, sha'at alameid botar, and where you, what yeshiva you study in. Imagine she's going to, this guy's going to give her his whole, his whole history, his whole ID, his driver's license number. <laughs> Tell me which yeshiva you learned in. So, kasa <laughs> v'nosan biyade. He complies. He gives her all the information, writes it down on a piece of paper. So, amda v'chilcha kol nechaseha. So, she is so inspired that she takes all of her assets. She must have been a very wealthy woman. She takes all of her assets and distributes them all. Shlish Lamalchus, she gives a third of it to the Roman government. Shlish Laaniyim, and a third of it she gives to the poor. Ushlish Nat Labiyad, and she takes a third of it with her to travel to this guy's yeshiva. Chutz Me'osan Matzaos, and she also has her all of these beautiful beds and cushions delivered with her to where this guy lives. Ubas Labais Midrashul Sarebichia. So she comes to the Medrash of Rebichia. Amr Lo Rebi. She says to him, Rebbe, I want you to make me into a convert. I want to convert to Judaism. Amar la biti. So he says to her, my daughter, Shama enayich nasat be'echad minat talmidim. Is it perhaps possible that you fell in love with a nice Jewish boy? Is that why you want to convert? Hotziyak sab miyada v'nasnalo. So she pulls out the piece of paper. She says, there's a nice bocher here. But, you know, here's the story. I guess after she explained to her what had happened, he says to her, Go, you have merited your reward. Go and take your nice bacher and take him home with you. And eventually the Gemara says that those elaborate mattresses which she had set up for him to sin with him were now used for their wonderful <coughs> Jewish Shalom Bayez home which they live built together that's the reward for tzitzis in this world. The person is careful for it with them. So, and, and certainly the infinite rewards of the world to come. See, I've been wearing tzitzis all my life, and I got a wonderful wife, so it seems to have worked. Um, but our our romance is not as uh, not as, as strange as this story is. But. Um, but the point of the, well, the point is, is that the mitzvah of tzitzis, as you see from this story, is to remind the individual that you can't go back. You can never go back to that place of ordinary living. You can't go back to that place of being entrenched in the physical world. And that's really what, why the Gemara uses that example of tzitzis. It's the nesher. It's the that which is no share, that which causes you to depart and to molt from, to shed yourself of this the perspectives of this world. Anyway, have a wonderful week. We'll see you later.